Well, thanks for making making it to the end of the day. I'll I'll try to keep it light and on time. And um, I guess uh, I'll also be repeating a lot of things that have been said throughout the day, and hopefully that that helps. Um, and I wanted to start with something very basic, which is the what is gravity. So I pulled out some definitions, and uh, of course it's uh, what we're all thinking about. And something we can think about is that uh, it's also the quality of being extremely important or serious. And I think that's very appropriate, um, talking about the gravitational force. Uh, but what I didn't know is that in the context of uh, brewing beer or wine, gravity means to the, the relative density and it's used to, um, uh, by measuring it at different stages of the fermentation to determine the amount of alcohol that it's gonna yield in, in the brew. So at least there is a context in which you can measure the time variation of gravity and first, this time variation exists and also has some practical implications. Now, uh, if what uh, Lucas has said is right, uh, some of us might be considering um, doing this type of uh, gravity test in the future. Um, but, um, well, so let's uh, go to more uh, serious things. And I think it was worth it also to um, think of the reasons to study modified gravity. And I think there are at least three, three of them. Uh, the first one is to find alternatives to lambda. Uh, we believe that um, the universe started in an era of accelerated expansion that was not caused by a cosmological constant, so why not having something like that? But most interestingly, we have, um, we're finding these tensions that, uh, I think this was shown uh, by Nima on the first day. We're finding these tensions um, in the Hubble rate uh, measured directly using distance ladder and inferred indirectly using the cosmic microwave background that are currently at the level of 3.4 sigma. There's also, there might be or maybe not, uh, lens, uh, tensions in the measurement of lensing, weak lensing. Um, DES, uh, Dark Energy Survey, says this is not uh, intention. Um, they say now, but whatever, if it's intention or not, we're going to find out in the next data release when their, their error bars are going to shrink considerably and there's going to be something there. So either there is some systematic effects uh, or there is some new physics that's worth exploring. Now, the second reason is purely theoretical, um, and I'm not going to talk about that much. I just wanted to point out that if you go to Wikipedia, there is a very nice page that summarizes the unsolved problems in physics, and about a third of them involve gravity in one way or the other. So things like the expansion of the universe at different stages, the origin of the universe, uh, quantum gravity, and so on. So I think it's, it's worth it that even if, if there is something weird about gravity having to do with dark energy or inflation or whatever, might teach us uh, valuable lessons about very different things. And well, of course, the third um, reason to modify gravity is to test gravity, to obtain predictions in as many theories as we can and uh, use them to not only um, um, to not only validate the standard predictions, but also rule out these theories and do it in as many regimes as we can possibly access. Um, because it's the end of the day, and I guess many of you have very important emails to write, I'm going to start with my main results. Um, and I have the good news and the bad news. So the, the good news is that um, uh, we're finding um, self-accelerating models, where here self-acceleration means acceleration without a cosmological constant, plain and simple, uh, that have some nice features. First, they, um, they feed current data, although they have some tensions with uh, some data sets. And most interestingly, perhaps, they, they solve uh, or would solve the tension with the Hubble rate, at the very least. Um, Interestingly, also, they require massive neutrinos, which is cool because if something like this is true, then we have detected massive neutrinos from cosmology. Um, oh, and of course, the bad news. I clearly didn't want to talk about that. <laughs> but um, the bad news is that precisely the models that can explain this uh, have um, tweaked the, the, the propagation of gravitational waves. 
And um, we're in a few weeks or a month or whenever, we're going to either have models that are cosmologically OK, but are going to be ruled out by the hundreds of sigmas, by the anomalous speed. Or also, uh, we have the models that have very standard, completely standard propagation of the gravitational waves, but they rule out at 8.2 sigma um, by the ISW effect. So um, uh, I usually introduce Hordensky's theory. Um, the, I think it's uh, mainly um, a nice framework to put together a lot of very different theories that we've studied in different regimes. Things like, of course, GR, uh, quintessence, K-essence, Brans Dickey, um, equivalently F of R, chameleons, um, kinetic gravity braiding, and different types of Galileons or gauss bonnet terms can be fit into this uh, description. So it's perfect to, the equations have been derived, you have um, a lot of information to test very general theories in, in one stroke. Uh, there are also theories beyond Hordensky. I'm putting them for completeness, but I'm, I'm barely going to mention them. And well, the first part of my talk on cosmological tests and, and dark energy models, um, I think this also has been presented. Uh, since we have Hordensky, is a very huge theory. It has uh, four, is there a question? Oh, OK. Um, four free functions of two variables. You need to choose initial conditions. It's, uh, it's a mess. So uh, people have, um, for quite a while, tried to come up with clever ways to reduce this freedom by narrowing the scope of the uh, system we're studying. Uh, so you can think of this, uh, I like to think of this uh, effective theory of dark energy of, or the alpha functions uh, introduced by Emilio Bellini and Igi Savitsky as a generalization of the equation of state for quintessence. So you can, uh, whatever your theory is, this is all, um, and if the theory is second order, this is all there is on a cosmological background. Um, I think what's nice about uh, Emilio and Iggy's parameterization is that it, it can be very clearly connected to the different terms that appear in the equations of motion for the degrees of freedom of the theory. So looking at the equation for tensors, um, these functions uh, are very complicated expressions, but they're just two of them. Uh, at the tensors and the scalar field, you can make a choice on how to parameterize these functions that it's very meaningful. Um, this function can also be connected to, to the theory, and if we measure these functions, we can infer back the properties of gravity. Um, simplest function that is present in any theory is the called kinetically. This is just the kinetic term for the scalar field perturbations. Next, we have kinetic gravity braiding, which is uh, sourced by almost all the functions and represents a non-diagonal kinetic term that mixes the scalar perturbations in the metric with the uh, scalar degree of freedom. And now, so, oh. if there is, um, if we look at the tensor equations, we can define the running of the effective Planck mass or the time variation of the strength of gravity on cosmology. And uh, of course, the um, famous or infamous uh, anomalous speed of gravitational waves or tensor speed excess, uh, which determines the tensor perturbations and also gravitational waves on the FRW background. Now. Um, one nice thing, as I said, of this uh, very general framework is that you can use it once and for all, and that's what we did. Uh, we implemented it in the, in the class code, uh, producing the Hordensky in the cosmic linear and isotropy solving system, or high class, uh, whose goals is to um, first to treat um, dark energy and modify gravity in as much detail as we treat lambda CDM. So in principle, this is linear theory, but other than that, we use no approximations unless they speed up the code and are justified. And, um, and we're also deriving the initial conditions and, and so on. So we really want to do something as detailed as, uh, as class or uh, if you want man Berchinger for standard cosmology. Um, also, the other goal is to make it into a public tool that is valid for as many theories as possible. For this, Hordensky is a very good choice. And this is 
so that uh, future students can rely on this and they don't have to build a code from scratch for any little model they want to test. I would have liked to have that when I was a student. Um, code is very flexible. It's very easy to add new models, compatible with massive neutrinos, and almost all the other options that are in class. Um, it's been very uh, well tested against other codes. There is a paper led by Emilio Bellini that is going to appear hopefully later this week in which we test this against an ensemble of different codes and for a variety of models, um, including Brands DK, different parameterizations, Galileans, etc. So um, we use high class um, to um, implement different models of modified gravity. And one of the flagships of Hordensky theory is the Galilean gravity or covariant Galilean. Um, I like to think of this as the simplest Hordensky theory that has all the ingredients. So here in this simplified notation, um, in the Galilean, I'm in principle allowing for all the different terms to be there with a very simple uh, dependence. Also, a bit more on the technical side, this, um, the Hordensky functions only depend on the derivatives of the field which makes the, the theory shift symmetric. Nothing here depends on the value of the field. So we can shift the, this value and express uh, at least the field equation in terms of a conservation, a conserved current. And this simplifies things a lot. Uh, Galileo is also interesting because it's connected to, uh, it was actually derived as a limit of DGP in which the scalar field is the uh, coordinate of the extra dimension in which our brain is embedded. Uh, it's also connected to some limit of massive gravity in which the scalar field is a helicity zero mode. And most interestingly, it has, it's known to have self-accelerating solutions that don't require a cosmological constant. Uh, now, these solutions, I'm not going to really uh, talk much about this because Alex is giving a, a talk focused on this. Alex Barreira is giving a uh, a talk on this on Thursday. Uh, just to show the plot, uh, we find that um, feeding, um, feeding the Galileon to Planck and some BAO data um, and projecting on the Hubble rate, we find that preferred, uh, higher values are preferred, therefore potentially solving this tension with the Hubble Space Telescope measurements. And also, we, we find that the model requires neutrinos. This is, um, uh, at the very least, even if you don't trust this model, even if this model is ruled out, this shows that whenever you see constraints on neutrino mass from cosmology, they can be very model dependent. So you have to take this with a grain of salt. And also for H0 from the CMB. If you, if you do the same, use the same data on lambda CDM, you end up in this region, which, as you see, is very different. It's a very different universe. Um, I guess Alex will talk about some tension that it's, uh, we find with current BAO data. Oh, BAO have improved in recent years. Um, but the bulk of our analysis is uh, looking at the ISW effect. Um, and well, we've seen some of this before. Uh, we use the ISW effect um, as measured from the cost correlation between Planck temperature and this WISE galaxy sample. That's a low redshift, uh, all sky infrared survey. And again, I'm not going to um, talk about details. Um, but what's interesting is if you project the Galileon in this parameter space, this is, um, this is after some simplifications, like getting the right omega dark energy and, and putting the field in the, um, in the shift symmetry attractor. Um, you can, uh, any Galileo model can be projected in this uh, parameter space. And you see that the Quintic model uh, that has all the, um, all the G functions uh, with this shape is, of course, the, um, uh, the largest re region we found. And then the Quartic model, uh, which does not have G5, is a subset of it. And then there is the Cubic model, which is this, this little spec in the parameter space. And uh, what we found is that, as um, I think Lucas said, that some dark energy models get the wrong sign of the ISW effect. And this is, uh, this is really true for a lot of uh, Galileo models. So here, the colors represent um, the amplitude. Um, I'm not sure if it's the amplitude or the goodness of fit of the ISW effect. 
but um, the notation is that green points are good and red points are bad. Um, just, uh, and what's interesting is that the cubic uh, galileon, that speck of the parameter space, is on the very bad region. So you always get a negative ISW uh, signal for this sample, and that's ruled out by 8.2 sigma. And um, as we know, the cubic uh, model is the only one that does not affect the speed of gravitational waves. So uh, in the rest of my talk, I'm going to show a little bit what the implications of these gravitational wave measurements can potentially be. And so first, look this um, parameter space, uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, like internal parameters of the model, but we can also project here the, the speed of gravitational waves. Uh, it's measured by alpha t on the, on the same diagram. And we see that uh, there is a line here where the speed at redshift zero is it's not modified. Of course, this line crosses the, the cubic model. And then you have a region of the parameter space where gravitational waves are slower than the speed of light and another region where they're faster. Um, Cherenkov radiation bounds if um, they, they would rule out this, uh, this region uh, from high energy cosmic rays, rays and would therefore rule out the the quartic Galileo model. But in principle, this, this region is, is still viable, at least for a couple of weeks. Um, we can also see very, it's not very difficult to convince yourself that even if you're, let's say we are in this line of no modification at redshift zero, if uh, you throw in the numbers, it's very easy to see that um, all these models that fall to zero at um, low redshift, they're going to have different uh, gravitational wave speed at an earlier time. And if you look at this is a random sample from our uh, Markov chains, you can see that this variation can be pretty wild. So it goes all the way to minus one where things become unstable. So um, there's really no way out of this. Um, so you either, um, well, you fine tune at some, at some point or you choose the theory that does not have these terms, which is the cubic Galileon, and then it's ruled out by the ISW effect at high significance. Um, now, something that it's uh, worth pointing out and uh, sometimes uh, is a bit confusing is that this, um, this modification to the linear gravitational wave equation uh, does not distort the waveform. So we have the same propagation speed for every frequency in a gravitational wave signal. Uh, and therefore, we need an electromagnetic counterpart. Otherwise, the signal is the same. It just takes longer to arrive, but it's otherwise the same as it was when it was emitted. And this is in, it's quite different from the case of massive gravity, where you have this other modification that affects the, the velocity, but in a, in a frequency-dependent way. And this is the reason why LIGO, um, in its uh, three events that involve black holes with no electromagnetic counterparts, has been able to put quite, quite good bounds on the mass of the graviton. That's true, yeah. There's 10 orders of magnitude. If you want to constrain massive gravity at dark energy, there's, and I think it cannot really get better. I saw a talk on doing that, like constraining supermassive black holes with LISA and electromagnetic counterparts at redshift 10, and maybe they get one order of magnitude better. So um, anyway, uh, as um, uh, Lucas said before, uh, the fact that the sources are very far away and the travel time is so humongous, we can put, put um, extremely tight bounds um, on, the, um, uh, on this gravitational wave speed. Uh, if you turn this around, means that if the Galileon or something like that is the true dark energy model, then this time is huge and you will never measure it with something like a gamma ray burst, something violent that just hits you for a couple seconds. Um, instead, in that case, you could still consider uh, continuous sources. Again, when you turn on LISA, there, there are such sources. 
and you could get bounds um, that are like one part in 10 to the 12. But um, that seems um, that it's not gonna be very relevant anymore. Now, uh, <laughs> the, um, the, the, the event, uh, let me talk about it, the event um, that was announced on Twitter by an astronomer in Texas. Uh, it will blow your socks off. It will certainly blow mine. Um, I mean, I, I think at this point, uh, it's believable. Uh, we can trust it, but I, I was just not, I would want to make a um, word of caution against uh, Twitter science because there was another GW event. This time GW is global warming uh, a few years ago by then the uh, man who would become the president of the US. And well, this is certainly not very good science. And I, I would keep um, drawing conclusions from Twitter. Uh, but anyway, something that is uh, interesting, how much? Five, okay, perfect. I think it's interesting is, um, and we did, is to dig uh, into the, the causes of this anomalous gravitational wave speed. And um, I think a very pedagogical example is in this uh, paper about K-essence, uh, uh, where they look at the, um, um, if you see a canonical scalar field has a speed of uh, sound equal to one, and if you modify the canonical, um, the kinetic term uh, by a field dependence, you also get one, uh, and one way to see this is that there exists a transformation uh, that makes the field canonical. Um, so of course, to get um, a non-canonical, uh, sorry, um, different propagation speed, you need to go to something like K-essence, some non-canonical field, uh, in which case, no such transformation exists, and um, you end up with a different propagation speed. Um, the, it's very easy, uh, well, it's very illuminating to look at this in terms of an effective metric on which the perturbations of the field propagate, and the condition for these perturbations to have a different speed is uh, for this effective metric to not be proportional to the, to the standard matter metric. So we did something like that, but uh, for gravity, um, sorry, this slide is a bit overloaded. Uh, in this paper, by looking at the, um, the linear theory of a, a modified gravity theories on an arbitrary background, not just cosmological, and then taking a small scale limit um, and finding um, an effective metric for the, for the gravitational wave perturbations. Um, and we find two conditions. Uh, the, the first one sort of obvious. You need a vacuum expectation value for the field, some time derivative that picks this um, uh, reference frame, like sort of spontaneously breaks Lorentz symmetry. And also you need um, for this effective metric not to be proportional to the gravitational or the matter metric, which um, uh, you can boil it down by looking at the equations of motion to the equations of motion, including the vial tensor. And the reason for this is that if you, if you look at the Ricci and you perturb it and look only transverse and trailless perturbations, you get that the type of derivatives you get are um, contracted with the standard metric. So you will get just this thing here and you will not change the speed. So if your theory is second order, uh, then second derivatives of the metric are uh, come only from the um, Riemann or the vial, and then you get this type of structure, structure that can change the propagation <coughs> speed. Um, in theories beyond Hordensky, you have higher derivatives, and this is, this is a bit more complicated, but um, you can see it in this way. Now, um, I'm just, I'm finishing now. Something that, um, of course, is very interesting of this gravitational wave event, and the fact that you can detect it with uh, such high precision is that the classification of theories of gravity by their propagation speed of gravitational wave is really a binary classification. So you have theories where the speed is exactly the speed of light, and you have theories where it's not. Uh, so in a little bit of time, these theories are um, going to be highly constrained, certainly going to be uh, gone for any objective that has to do with modeling dark energy. Um, unless, except some fine tunings. 
Um, of course, uh, by gravity here, I put an asterisk because um, connecting to Anne's talk, um, there's uh, the anomaly speed happens in the auxiliary metric. And the reason is not because the kinetic term is not canonical, which it is, but because the, um, the effective metric is not, if you have a cosmological background, is not proportional to F or W. So then this uh, propagations of this guy go on F while uh, matter ones go on G. And in principle, this can be um, detected, but it's hidden by, by this mass matrix that Anne showed. And I think um, in her case, it might be more possible to detect because the coupling is different. But in standard by gravity, this, this would be very, very tricky. So um, the other theory I wanted to highlight to some extent is that um, among the survivors uh, to the event are going to be the theories that are um, related by a conformal transformation to GR or really any other theory that has uh, speed of uh, gravitational waves equal to one. So any theory that you can construct with one of those doing a conformal transformation will, um, will, will be fine just for this argument of the effective metric being um, needing to be not proportional to get an anomalous speed. Um, this basically leaves, uh, of course, uh, K-essence, KGB, uh, something like a Brandsdicke coupling, and also in the beyond Hordensky um, uh, realm, the, the one that was actually the, the first, first theory beyond Hordensky presented. The, the more popular ones, unfortunately, are going, are going to go with uh, the same way as the, as the Hordensky uh, higher order Hordensky. And well, just my conclusions, uh, the main ones is that uh, scalar tensor cosmology is very well understood. We have a very general description of the theories and, and, uh, and very flexible, accurate software to obtain predictions. Um, hopefully there are interesting dark energy models. Uh, uh, if the tensions persist in the coming times, then uh, it, it's certainly gonna be worth it to look at this as a possible solution, not only early universe solutions uh, like most people are doing. And also, this, any of these models can be tested by in a lot of regimes. Uh, I mentioned neutrinos for the Galileans, but also solar system, uh, smaller scales, and also, of course, uh, gravitational waves, which is going to be the most critical test for uh, ruling out this theory, and possibly also a lot of other theories. So thank you very much. You made a comment saying that uh, this series will be ruled out except for fine tunings. Is that true? Or well, I, I, don't, I don't even know what they are. So, but do so you really rule out, the, or do you need you can still make theories which accelerate and whether they accelerate, I don't know. But for example, I don't I don't think you can fine tune in within Hordensky G four and G five, because even if you do that at the level of the background, which you might, if you have a spatial gradient. Um, you need a cancellation between second derivatives of the scalar and first derivatives. So that, I don't think that's going to work. I think it might work between beyond Hordensky and Hordensky. But it's going to be a fine tuning at the level of we saw 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 17. So whether that is believable or interesting is another question. Are you assuming uh, that transformation is imbatible, or do you also include the non-imbatible transformation of them? Oh, yeah, um, good question. I'm, I'm implicitly assuming that this is invertible. Of course, if the transformation is not invertible, you wouldn't be equivalent to ER, and then you cannot work in the same. Um, you, I, I don't think you can make that connection. I guess that it might be that that theory is viable, but I'm, I haven't really thought about that. Right. <laughs> yeah, and that probably has the good uh, g gravitational wave speed. Uh, 
mimetic gravity, the original one, I think, is C equals X, or C proportional to X. Um, <laughs> right. But if it's not invertible, then is it really related? Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment that um, if you look at the Horndesky line there, it's even worse than many have written because if you have any coupling, this is the G4 phi, right? That immediately means that phi must be rolling very slowly if it's really to be not unreasonable. If it's, not, if it's rolling slowly, that means the only thing you're allowed to have from the other operators is a standard kinetic term and a potential. So essentially, you're in Brands Dickey. So either you have Brands Dickey or you are. Uh, or it's something like uh, KS and KGB. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, I haven't looked into that. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I, I'm not sure you can do that and completely model independent as a model independent statement for all theories. Oh, well, I mean, from okay. that time. Thank you.